Hey there, my name is Joe. I am a modular synth enthusiast and uh, the proud owner of a monome teletype. This guy right here. Um, so I wanted to make some videos uh, just kind of about the teletype and uh, maybe help you get familiar with uh, how to use it and get the best out of it. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with a, a really high level overview of uh, really kind of the monome ecosystem. Um, so this is the teletype, um, and uh, what, you know what is it? Um, it's kind of an undefined thing, but um, you know, at the risk of oversimplifying it, I would say that it, uh, just like all of the other modules in this rack here, is, is a device that controls voltage over time, and uh, what voltages it produces at what time is is really up to you. Um, so. Um, really, I wanted to kind of do some experiments and, uh, you know, just build some projects and scripts to kind of help you understand that better. Um, really high level, I wanted to kind of talk about the ecosystem here. Um, so we've got the teletype and, uh, you know, it's got these CV inputs and outputs that I can connect to other modules. Um, in the back of this, um, there is um, a system called um, I squared C, um, or in monon specific, uh, sometimes it's just called II. Um, and it's just basically three little jumper cables that connect uh, various modules uh, on the back side so that you don't have to use any front side connections. And the teletype can talk to a lot of these. So um, here I've got the ER301 sound computer from Orthogonal Devices. That's uh, one of the devices that uh, the teletype can talk to over II. Um, this one here is the, uh, sorry, this one here is the uh, the teletype uh, output uh, expander, sometimes known as the TXO. Uh, this one right here is the Monome Ansible. Sorry, this one's made by uh, BPC Music. Um, this one's actually um, a complete DIY project. So the, it's open source hardware and software. You can build one yourself. You can find for more information on lines. Uh, this is the Monome Ansible. That's also connected over II. Uh, here to the right of the uh, teletype, we've got the Teletype Input Expander, or TXI. That one's also made by BPC Music, um, also open source hardware and software. Um, here I've got the uh, the Crow, uh, which is a collaboration between Monome and Whimsical Wraps. That one's also connected to the I2C or II bus. I don't think it can talk to Teletype just yet. This one's, this one's a brand new module, so, you know, lots of stuff uh, happening with this at the moment. Um, down here I've got the Fader Bank 16N, so this is also a completely open source hardware and software kind of project. Um, so all these modules can uh, talk to the teletype, and I, I don't have all of them. Um, there are some others by Whimsical Wraps, uh, like Just Friends and the W Slash. Um, those are very popular amongst the Lions community. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing a few others uh, here as well. Um, you can find a, a complete list of them uh, on Lines. Um, so the first few videos, anyway, I don't think we'll focus on uh, any of these devices that are connected through I2C or II. Um, we'll just kind of focus on the teletype itself and its CV inputs and outputs. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you the, the larger picture. Once you start adding some of these other I2C devices, it can greatly uh, expand the, the capability uh, and the power of your teletype. Uh, but it's very powerful on its own. So um, real quick, I just wanted to kind of review the inputs and outputs So across the... Uh, Top two rows here, we have uh, the inputs. Um, and these are probably the closest thing to kind of a dedicated function on the teletype. Um, they really only accept uh, triggers or gates in. And uh, when they receive a trigger or gate in, they will um, fire off a script that corresponds to their number. So they're, they're pretty dedicated in what they do. Um, the second row, or the, sorry, the third row here, um, we're starting with the outputs. Um, Actually, let me, uh, let me get a better angle on the teletype. There we go. So this third row, uh, we have the trigger outputs. Um, so these are um, kind of the least flexible outputs. Uh, they, they basically are just uh, kind of binary outputs that can put out you know, either a high voltage or um, a low voltage, zero or um, I can't remember if it's five volts or, uh, or 10 volts, but we'll, we'll find out here. Uh, and then this last row are kind of the most flexible outputs. Um, these are capable of generating um, 0 to 10 volts out. Um, we also got kind of a special input up here uh, called in. Um, so this can, um, you know, accept any voltage on its input. You can put, a, you know, an LFO in here or whatever you want, and the teletype is able to read the voltage that's there. 
And we've also got this uh, param knob up top, and that uh, is basically a, a user-definable uh, encoder. Um, so it can also read um, the position or the value of that param knob. Uh, looking down just uh, a little bit further here, let's see if we can adjust the camera a bit. Uh, we've got a button, and this has uh, you know a few different purposes. And then we've got a USB connector, um, which normally you would plug in a, uh, a WERTY keyboard. Um, you can also uh, plug a grid into this with some caveats. Um, so the uh, if you have a newer one, I think you can plug a grid directly in. If you have a, an older teletype, um, you may need to power the grid externally. Uh, I don't think any harm can come from you know just plugging it in and trying it. But if you have an older teletype and you plug in a grid directly and you uh, you know, you light up a certain number of lights to a certain brightness. I think it can, uh, you know, potentially not have enough power. Um, okay, so I think that's kind of the overall high-level hardware overview. Um, let's uh, take a look at some navigation. Okay, well, let's just talk about some basic navigation here. So this is, uh, I think, pretty much the default screen you'll see when you turn your teletype on. Um, this is kind of the live coding scene. Um, so anything I type here into the uh, into the window and press enter, it'll be executed immediately. So you know I can do something like trigger tr.p, which stands for trigger.pulse1. Um, and if you keep an eye on the LED, can you see it here? Can't quite see it. Keep an eye on the LED by that cable there, and you should see that light flash. And if I press my up arrow, it'll kind of go back through the stack of commands that I've typed. Um, so we can flash it again, just sending a trigger out of there. Um, if I press my tab key, um, that's going to take me into the scripts. Um, this is, there are uh, eight scripts we talked about before, these uh, that are fired by these. So um, if I press my left and right square bracket keys, I can kind of navigate between the scripts. And you can see them down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we've got two special scripts. Uh, this one's called Metro uh, or Metronone. And we've got this special script uh, that's I or uh, init or initialize. Um, so these are the scenes. Uh, these are where you would uh, kind of type your uh, snippets of code that you want to uh, you know, save and make work together. If I press my tab key again, I'm going to come to the pattern tracker. And we've got four patterns here um, available. And each of these contain up to... 64 steps. I'm pressing my arrow keys here to scroll through them, so they're numbered 0 through 63. Um, and these patterns are, um, they're basically just, you know, arrays of numbers. Um, and what they do is defined by you. The patterns have some special properties, you know, for um, kind of reading them sequentially. So, you know, a common thing to store here might be some, like some note values. Um, but really, I mean, they're just numbers. So, you know, what they, what they do is completely uh, up to what you do with your script. Um, if I press my left, uh, sorry, my uh, tab key again, that takes me back to the, uh, the live uh, view. Um, if I press the tilde key, which uh, is generally the key under your escape key, um, that's going to bring up uh, a variable display. Um, so this is pretty handy. Um, you can see here the, we've got X, Y, Z, and T, and then we've got A, B, C, and D. And uh, it just displays their values. Right now, A is set to 1, B is set to 2, C is set to 3, and D 4. And all these variables on the right-hand side are set to uh, 0. So this is a pretty handy way to uh, you know see some things that are going on. Um, I think the only other view available, if you uh, hold down the Alt key and press G, that's going to bring up um, the grid display. Uh, so this is for the, for the Monome grid. Uh, which right now is connected to my Ansible, so it's doing some stuff, but you can uh, connect this grid up to Teletype as well. Um, so if you don't have a grid, you can actually uh, use this grid display to um, to uh, use uh, grid uh, type scripts. Um, so if I hold down my Alt key and press my arrow keys, it'll move around the grid, and if I hold down my Alt key and um, uh, press, I think, space, it'll, it'll fire that uh, grid button. Um, if I hold down Alt and press G again, it'll take me kind of a full screen grid view. And here I don't need to hold down the Alt key anymore. I can just press my arrow keys to move around the various grid buttons and, and press my space key to fire them. 
if I press Alt G one more time, that's going to take me back to the live coding view. Um, so I think that's it for basic navigation. Those are kind of all of the screens. Um, so um, really quickly, let me show you the project that we're going to build today, or something very close to it. Um, uh, actually, I guess there are a few more screens to cover here. So um, if I hit my escape key, that's going to take me into uh, the scene load view. So right now we're looking at uh, scene number one, which I've titled Rhythm Machine. That's what we're going to build today. I can use my left and right square bracket keys to move between the scenes. I think there are maybe 24 of them available. Um, oh, not more than that. 32 available, uh, numbered one, uh, 0 to 31. Um, so if I'm uh, in this mode, I can press Enter, and uh, that will load that scene. Um, so now if we go back and I press Tab and go into the uh, scripts views, uh, you can see that there is stuff in here that is part of the scene, uh, this rhythm machine scene. Um, so really quickly, let me just show you what this does. Um, so I've got this connected up. The, the modules that we're going to use here, um, I'm going to use here, are Maths and the ER301. So you don't need these modules for uh, you know this script. Um, the Maths I'm just using for uh, basically a clock. Um, so you could use any uh, clock module that you want to. Um, and the ER301, I'm basically using this as um, uh, four different drum modules. Um, so you don't need an ER301. You could use any any. Maybe you have some dedicated drum modules that you want to use, or um, you know you could use, even use just some oscillators, VCAs, and envelopes. You know, and set them up to respond to triggers. Basically, we're just going to be setting up uh, a series of time triggers. So, let me show you what this final result sounds like. Um, come out a little bit here. Um, and on the maths, I've got a, a cycle button up here that uh, will basically turn the turn the LFO or what I'm using as a clock on and we'll just take a listen to what this sounds like. This red cable being uh, fed into the first uh, trigger input that's coming from maths. That's my clock. If I pull that out you're going to notice it stops. Um, so this entire kind of rhythm machine here is being fed off of this one clock. So I plug it in it starts back up again. And I've got the param knob uh, wired up to uh, this wood block sound that you're hearing, and it sets a probability that that will fire. So if I turn this all the way down, uh, you're going to notice that wood block sound fades out. It doesn't happen anymore. If I turn it up a little bit, you'll hear we get an occasional wood block sound. And if I crank it all the way up, here we get a, a wood block sound kind of on every 16th note beat. So I've got the full range in between here. If I set it at, you know, 50%, it's going to happen fairly often. It's probably kind of hard to see that knob there. So that's what we're going to build today. Um, let me stop that and we'll just, uh, we'll kind of walk through uh, the scripts for building this up. And, you know, uh, I guess more importantly, kind of the mindset behind it or, or how it all works and, and how we kind of put this together piece by piece and, uh, you know, debug it. All right, well, let's get started building this uh, rhythm machine uh, scene. Um, you can see here I've got the uh, command reference for the teletype printed out. Um, I'm a pretty paperless person. <laughs> I probably only reach for the print button. I can probably count on my fingers the number of times I hit the print button a year these days. Um, but, um, you know, a couple of those times are for this uh, command reference sheet. It's just I find it pretty handy to uh, have a, a hard copy of it. Um, so we will be referring to this. I would probably recommend you print this out as well. You can definitely put it on a tablet or whatever if you prefer that. But uh, this is one thing I really like to have a hard copy of. Um, okay, so um, I've got uh, an output from Maths coming into the first trigger port here. Um, and it's just uh, the kind of the far left bottom output. It's just basically acting as a clock. And like I said, you don't need a Maths here. You can, uh, you know, you can use a... Uh, any kind of clock source. You could even use like a, a square wave LFO or you, you could probably even get by with some other, uh, you know, oscillator to serve as a clock source here. Um, so I've got this coming into trigger one. Um, and I'm going to start math cycling here just so it gives me that. And the first thing we're going to do um, is we're going to set up a script. Um, so this is coming into the trigger one. Uh, I'm going to go to script one. And I can, I'm doing that with the, uh, again, the left and right square bracket keys. 
And just to kind of get a visual on this, um, let's um, trigger uh, TR1 uh, every time this clock fires. So I'm just going to do trigger pulse TRP1. And you can see this LED here has uh, started to flash, indicating that um, you know I'm getting a trigger here. Um, okay, so uh, next question. Um, how fast, how fast is this clock? I mean, I can kind of look at it visually. I could have this trigger a sound if I wanted to, so that I could, uh, so that I could hear it. Um, actually, let's let's do that. Uh, again, here I'm using the ER301, but you could use, you know, any basically any module that you have set up to respond to a trigger and make a noise. Um, so I'm going to plug this into gate one on my ER301. And so you can hear I'm getting a sound with each uh, with each trigger. Let's disconnect that for a moment. So how fast is this clock that I have coming in here? So, um, we can use the uh, teletype to figure that out. Um, if you look at the documentation here, we've got this um, last operator, last x, and it says um, get value in milliseconds since last script run time. So uh, let's see here. We're talking about uh, script one here. Let me flip back to the live coding screen and let me just do last one. And it says 265. Let me run it again and it says 130. I'm just hitting the up arrow key here. So you can kind of see it's giving me uh, some really strange values here. It just seems to be hopping all over the place. And uh, it really kind of depends, you know, the script runs. And then at some point I run this last one and you know however long it's been since the script run uh, that's what it tells me so that's not very useful um, but if i hit my right bracket key to go back into the script here um, we can actually um, make some more use of this so let me insert a new line here and by the way what i did here was just hit um, i hit shift enter to insert a new line and that kind of copies the script line before and then i hit my up arrow key uh, and I can backspace this out and start typing a new one here. So let's run this exactly when this script one fires and let's set our variable X equal to last one. So now if I toggle back over here and if you don't see these variable displays, um, it's in the tilde key to bring these up. Um, we can see that X is now a lot more consistent. It's uh, 474, Maybe 475, so maybe it's like 474 and a half or something like that. But, um, you know, we can kind of only deal with integer values here. So what that's telling me is that um, I'm getting a clock pulse every 474 milliseconds. So that's good to know. Um, you know, if I wanted to figure out what that was, one thing I could do is kind of pull out a calculator. We know that um, the frequency in hertz is 1 divided by the time in milliseconds. So um, let me pull out a calculator here. We'll just do 0.474, and I uh, well, guess we need to flip this, and we'll just do um, 1 over x, and that gives me 2.1 hertz, so uh, about 2.1 um, cycles per second. Um, that's per second, so if I wanted to know beats per minute, I could um, multiply that by 60, 60 seconds in a minute. And that gives me about 126 and a half BPM. So we could actually kind of figure that out with the teletype too. Um, and, um, you know, we've got a function here. Let's see if I can find it on this cheat sheet here. Um, I believe that's going to be in the, the math section. Yep. Uh, so we've got BPM. Um, milliseconds per beat in BPM X. So if I flip back over here to the uh, live coding view, I'm actually on it, and I do uh, BPM 120. This is just a math function, so it's going to tell me that's uh, 500. 500 milliseconds is the equivalent of 120 BPM. And one thing I noticed when I looked through the documentation is that there's not really an inverse function for BPM. So I can't, you know, there's no function that if I put in 500, it's going to spit back out 120. There's nothing to do the reverse of this. Um, so I had to kind of figure out a workaround for it. And uh, it's kind of a little quirky, tricky workaround, but here's one thing we can do. Um, we can basically just test to see if whatever um, 
whatever uh, frequency or num the number of milliseconds since this last script fired um, is equal to a certain BPM. So let's set that up. Um, I'm going to do a loop here. Um, and let's just do some kind of a reasonable range of values. Let's do something like um, 80 BPM to, I don't know, 140 BPM. So basically every time this uh, script one fires, we're going to run this loop. Um, it's going to run 60 iterations of it here. It's going to run it from 80 to 140. And we're going to, what we're going to do here, um, so that's kind of the syntax for this loop. We do uh, loop start value, end value, colon, space, and then what we want to do. And what we want to do here is run script two. So script two, we don't have anything in it yet. Um, but if I use my right bracket key and arrow over here to script two, um, we can start to write this script. And what I want to do here is run a test. Um, now when we call a, uh, when we call a script from a, from a loop function, um, we're going to have access to this variable called i. And i is going to be equal to whatever loop iteration we're on. So as I call script 2, um, it's going to start at 80. And when I come over here the first time, i is going to be equal to 80. And when it runs it again the second time, i is going to be equal to 81. So I can use i to kind of do some tests against this loop iteration. So let's set that up. Uh, I'm going to do um, if... This is a conditional statement, and we're going to, you know, it's going to be a test here. Um, so I'm going to do equal eq if equal to um, i, um, and then we'll do, <clears throat> actually, no, let's do if equal to, If our BPM for I, which is going to be anywhere between 80 and I think 140, um, is equal to X, and we set e X equal to be our time in milliseconds between the last script, then what we're going to do is set Y equal to I. So basically what we're saying here is um, we're going to do a test here. We're going to say, what, what is the BPM for I? So what's the BPM for 80? I don't, I don't know what that is, um, but it's going to be a number in milliseconds. And if that happens to be equal to the time it takes our script to uh, run each time, uh, we're going to set Y equal to I, which in this case might be you know 80, any number between that. Let's take a look at that worked. Um, so I'll toggle back over here. And uh, yeah, I get, I get nothing. <laughs> So let's take a look at what might be wrong here. Um, I'm gonna jump back over to the live screen and we'll just do BPM 80 and we get 750. Hmm. All right, and um, we know that uh, X can be somewhere in there. Let's do BPM, what was the upper range of that? BPM 140 is 428. So it looks like I'm in range here. Um, X right now is 470. Um, we know I'm going to get 470, or sorry, 428 up to 750 as values for BPM. And we may just not be exact here. That may be the problem. We may need to adjust this uh, just a little bit. So I'm going to change the frequency on maths just a little bit. Oh, there we go. Nice. Um, so just changing the frequency just a little bit so we get an exact match. We can see I'm at 127 BPM. Let me slow the envelope down here, and on maths, I'm just adjusting the attack parameter to make this clock a little bit slower. So you can see the time that uh, X here, the time that it takes to, since that script has last run, basically the time between the scripts is going up, and Y, which represents my BPM, is going down. So if I can get it right in here at 500, which I actually managed to do, <laughs> That's 120 BPM, so that's kind of the, the same uh, clock cycle we saw there. Um, so this is probably not a very nice thing to do to teletype. <laughs> We're basically right now telling it, you know, every half a second, I want you to perform um, 60 operations. Um, 40 minus, 140 minus 80 is 60. Um, it's probably not a very nice thing to do to your processor, so... 
Um, you know, this is just kind of to demonstrate that we can do this kind of thing. I'm probably not going to leave this in here. I'm actually going to comment it out for now. So uh, if you hold down Alt and hit the uh, the backslash key, that comments a line of code out that will no longer run. So I'm no longer going to be firing the script to 60 times every half second. Okay, well, let's get on to uh, making some noise. Um, so we've already got our uh, output trigger one here, uh, firing right alongside the clock. Um, what I want to do is I want to take a kick drum, um, but I don't want it to fire on every clock. Uh, I, I want it to be, I don't really want it to be like a four on the four pattern. Uh, pattern. I'd like it to do that um, kind of only on the one and the three. So let's set that up. Um, what I really need here is kind of a clock divider, right? So if I come down here and I say, remember this script one is firing every clock pulse. If I say every two, let's trigger, send a pulse on trigger output two. So you can see the lights here. Um, trigger output one is flashing every clock pulse. This one's only doing it every other clock pulse. So basically what we've built here is a, a clock divider and we've divided by two. Um, let me take this and let's connect this up to my drum module for the ER301. I'll plug this into gate one here. Cool, and we're sounding good. Uh, the next thing I think I'd like to do is to set up a snare to fire on the two and the four. So basically every other beat uh, from the kick drum. So there's a couple different ways we could achieve this. Um, let's take, um, let's use the other command. Um, so we're every, every two clock pulses, we're firing trigger output two. So on the other ones, let's fire trigger trigger a pulse on trigger output three. And I'll start my clock up again here. So you can see these are firing against each other. Let's actually connect that up. I'll put that into my snare drum module. So we've uh, figured out how to make a clock divider. Um, so let's see here. What if I actually wanted to make a clock multiplier? What if I wanted something to happen, you know, faster than what this clock is coming in on? I think I do want to do that. I want to make kind of a, <clears throat> a symbol sound. Um, so <clears throat> there's probably a couple ways we could do that. Let's, um, I think we're going to use, uh, let's use the ratchet command. So... Uh, we've got a delay command, and if we add a dot .r to it, that's a kind of a ratchet command. So what that does, um, actually, let me show you on the on the live screen here. Let's do delay dot ratchet, and this takes two parameters. Um, the first one is the the number of events that you want to make happen. So let's do four, and let's just make those happen every 100 milliseconds. So number of times, and then the time in between them. And for this, let's just fire. Um, trigger output four, so trigger pulse four. So let's watch this light over here and let's see what happens. Oop, that was pretty fast. Um, let's slow that down a little bit. Let's make this like 300. I'll watch the light over here again. So you saw we got the initial um, pulse immediately and then we got an additional pulse every 300 milliseconds. So if we come back over to our script, we can add a new line here and let's do delay dot ratchet. And the number of times that we want to make this happen is um, every two. And how often do we want that to happen? So we want the first one to happen immediately. And then we want the second one to happen kind of twice as fast as uh, this clock that is coming in here. So 
we already know how to figure out what the timing on that clock is. We just do last one. If we want it to happen twice that fast, it's giving us a value in milliseconds, so we could just divide that by two. So let's do divide by two. Um, we'll divide last one by two. Um, so when you do a divide, you're taking uh, kind of what you want to divide by and then what you want to divide it by. We're dividing that um, time since last script one by two. Um, a lot of operators in the teletype um, have kind of a, a short version, an abbreviation for them. And for divide, it's just the slash symbol. Um, and the reason for that is um, you can see we've only got so many letters we can type on each line here. So sometimes there's a you know a condensed version of uh, some of these common operators. Um, they make it look a little bit more cryptic, but you're going to see them a lot. So we might as well get started uh, using them. And let's see here. Oh, yeah, we need a, uh, a separator. So delay to... That was only the first half of our statement. <laughs> so we'll put a colon here. And let's trigger... Pulse, uh, trigger pulse four. So this whole statement, um, we're going to set up a ratchet. It's going to happen twice. It's going to happen twice as fast as this clock, which right now would evaluate to about 250 milliseconds. We're going to pulse this uh, immediately and then 250 milliseconds later. Let's see if that works. I'm going to turn the clock back on. And you can see it's flashing twice as fast as uh, the first one here. Let's verify that by connecting it up to a sound. So we've got some good timing stuff going here. Um, let's see here. I am uh, currently out of script lines, and that is something that can definitely happen to you. Um, I'd like to keep this all in one script. Um, so one thing we could do here is we can do some refactoring. Um, you can see we've got two lines here, X last one and uh, trigger pulse one. Those really don't, uh, those would all fit on one line. Um, so one way we can do this uh, is to put a semicolon here. And if you put a semicolon and a space, we can actually kind of concatenate two lines onto one. So let's do trigger pulse one here. And then I'm going to do an alt delete to remove that line. So this is kind of just uh, the equivalent of the script that we already had. We just kind of combined these two lines into one and freed up a line for ourselves. Um, Okay, so let's um, let's make something pulse on the. So we've, right now we've got basically kind of quarter notes on you know for the kick and the snare. Um, we've got eighth notes for that cymbal sound. And I want to set up some sixteenth notes for this woodblock sound. Um, one thing you'll notice is that uh, I'm out of trigger ports up here. Um, I've only got these CV ports left. Um, I could reuse this one because I'm not really using it for anything, but I just kind of want to make the point here. I want to actually reuse one of these um, CV out ports as, uh, as a trigger out, so I'm going to set that up. So first let's start with the timing. Uh, we'll use another delay.ratchet. And this time I want four of them out. And I want to divide my last time by four. So I can't really do the same thing here uh, with the trigger dot pulse and the number. Um, but what I can do is run another script. Um, so let's do that. Uh, we're on script one now. Let's fire script two here. Now if I use my right bracket key to come over here, um, we're not really using this BPM script anymore. Um, so let's do alt delete, cut that line out. And what I want to do here is uh, set up this CV port to act as a trigger. So the first thing I want to do is turn it on. So let's do CV set one, and we'll just set it up to five volts. So this is a kind of a transcribe kind of function. This V, it just uh, you can do V one through ten, um, and it'll it'll set up that exact voltage. So that's going to turn it on. Um, if I were to start this up now, you're going to see it's just going to stay on. So what I need to do is turn it back off shortly afterward to, to make it look like a trigger. 
apologize. I didn't realize that cable was in the way there. Hopefully that didn't cause too much of a problem. So let's start it back off shortly after. So we're going to do a delay. And we'll just delay for 20 milliseconds. And we'll just turn this right back off. CV set 1 volt 0. Now let me start up my clock again and let's watch this light. Hmm. So it is firing a trigger. It doesn't really seem to be going fast enough. So maybe I've made an error here back on script one. So what am I saying here? I'm saying we're going to... We're doing a ratchet. Um, we're doing four iterations. And the length of them, we're dividing last one by four. Yeah, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, hmm. And in script two, we're just turning this on and back off. interesting we also seem to have kind of lost the hi-hat sound so well this is what script development is all about my friends um, <laughs> it does take some thinking I'm gonna pause the camera here think about this for a minute and I'll be back okay so I think what might be happening here we may only be allowed to have one ratchet cue so we may have to approach uh, one of these a little bit differently um, so let's take this one first of all we can Get rid of this script line. Um, actually, this may be part of the problem. I'm going to delete this, Alt Delete. We're not using that anymore. And that may be calling uh, script 2 when we don't want it to. Actually, let's just try it without that and see what happens. Yeah, that was the problem. <laughs> so we were calling script 2 kind of unexpectedly in that loop with that line. Um, anyway, it looks like we now have um, this set up to act like a trigger. Um, Let's connect it to a sound source and see what happens. Cool. All right, so now we've got the wood block firing on kind of 16th notes. Um, the last thing we wanted to do was um, put some control over that wood block on this param knob. So uh, let's take a look at doing that. Um, over here we've got uh, this acting as um, setting up the CV output to act like a trigger. And what we want to do is control the probability that this is going to happen. Um, so we've got the probability command. Um, uh, the probability command actually only accepts, you know, one um, kind of function or operator after it, and we actually need to do two here. So what we may need to do is to move this to uh, its own script. So let's take these two lines. Uh, I'm going to hold down Shift and press my down or up arrow key to select both of them. I'm going to hit Alt-X to cut them. And then I'm going to hit my right square bracket key to move to script 3 and Alt-V to paste them. So we basically just moved those lines from script 2 to script 3. Let's go back to script 2, which is executing on 16th notes. And we're going to set a probability that that will fire. So we'll do probability 50%. We'll run script, and I maybe should type that out. That's another shortcut, script 3. But if I don't have enough room, I can just type dollar sign. That will, that's uh, the shortcut for script. That'll run script 3. And... Let's hear how that works. So now you can hear that wood block is skipping some beats. We don't want it to just always be 50% though. What we want to do is um, read this parameter knob to figure out what that'll be. Um, to read the parameter knob, we just type uh, the word param and that will read the parameter knob. Uh, but param has a pretty wide range of values. Um, actually, let's let's save this script and take a look at that. So that's another thing you might want to know how to do. Um, I'm going to hit Alt, Escape, 
And this is just kind of like the loading preset, except it's for writing. Um, so I've already saved this once. Um, if I hit Alt-Enter, it's going to save again. Alt-Enter saves. And what I can do here now is just do an init.scene. And that'll reset everything in the scene. And now we can just kind of play with param. Um, we've already got um, something coming in on script one to fire. So let's just do x param. And if I go over here now, um, we've got 8,000. You can see this knob is set about halfway up. If I start turning it down, we go all the way to zero. If I bring it up to its max value, we're getting um, 16,320. So those aren't good numbers to use with the probability statement. We really want a probability between 1 and 100. Um, if we take a look at the, uh, the sheet again, we've got a param scale function. Uh, and it says, set static scaling of param knob to be between min and max. And so it's param.scale min max. Let's try that. Param.scale one, actually let's make it zero to 100. And you can see my X instantly flipped to be 41. So if I turn this knob all the way down now, we get zero all the way up and we get 100, just like we'd expect. So let's load our other script. I'll hit Alt Escape. We save that into scene two. Um, so I'll hit, oops, not alt escape. We just want to hit regular escape. That brings us into load scene mode. Script two, rhythm machine two. I'm going to hit enter to load it. Cool. So that param scale, you can kind of see that just, uh, we typed that into the live command window and it set it up for um, that entire scene. So. Let's go ahead and type param.scale 0 to 100 here. Um, but we want to make sure that happens. You know, if we go save this scene and then we load it up and we want to use it later, we want to ensure that um, that parameter is always scaled correctly. And that's what this special script here i init or initializes for. We can type commands in here, like param scale 0 to 100. And as soon as I load the scene, it's going to execute this initialize script or init script. Um, so that way, you know, as soon as the script loads, I can ensure that I'm getting values of uh, 0 to 100 when I read the param knob. So, um, now that we've done that, we should get a probability between 0 and 100 that script 3 will fire, and script 3 is um, what's flashing our CV1 output like a trigger. Um, let's start the clock again and see if this works. So, if I turn this knob all the way down to 0, the wood block should completely fall out. If I turn it all the way up to 100, I should get one on every single beat. And if I turn it down somewhere in the middle, I'll just get the wood block on uh, some random beats. So, uh, we've built ourselves a nice little rhythm machine patch here. It just uses this single clock as its input and uh, it does some pretty cool stuff. Um, and you can see we used um, the init script. We used uh, script one pretty extensively. We used script two for just kind of a one-liner and we used uh, script three. So uh, four total scripts. Let's go ahead and hit alt escape and we'll just overwrite what's uh, in this scene preset. So we'll hit alt enter to write it. Um, you know, another thing we might want to do, I'm going to hit um, escape here and uh, we can put some comments in here. Let's say um, clock on N1 and we'll do um, kick on trigger two, snare on trigger three, uh, hi hat on trigger four. Wood block on CV1. So we can put some comments on with this. These are pretty handy, you know, if we want to remember what we did later. I'm going to hit Alt Enter to write that. And if I hit Escape again, now you can see, you know, when we go through the scene that um, I've not only got the name of it, but, you know, I've got some comments to kind of help me remember how it works.
right, so to wrap up, um, we've barely scratched the surface of the teletype here. This was uh, a pretty basic uh, scene or script, a set of scripts. Um, there's a lot more to it than this. Um, you know, I would say um, it can be tough kind of figuring out how to, you know, create these scenes. Um, you know, I, even I had to pause the video here and think for a while. And, uh, you know, I'm sure even some of the some of the rock star uh, teletype developers on lines, uh, you know, occasionally get uh, kind of a head block or a mental block and, you know, have to really stop and think about things for a while. It, uh, you know, if you're just kind of an aspiring developer or, uh, you know, new to the teletype, um, you know, expect to get stuck once in a while. And um, I, I think the real key is to persevere and uh, keep going and, you know, try to, you know, maybe you just have um, some bugs in your code or, or maybe the approach that you're thinking of uh, isn't really working and you need to kind of go back to the drawing board and, and figure out uh, another way to do that. Um, I think perseverance is uh, definitely the key to success here. Um, you know, as far as inspiration, I mean, um, you know, once in a, a blue moon, the stars align or, you know, I have a particularly good cup of coffee and I sort of have this fully baked idea for a scene or a, a script that I want to create. Um, but most of the other times, it's just kind of half-baked ideas, and uh, they evolve as they go. So, you know, you kind of implement, uh, you know, a small idea, and um, as, you, as you're making it, you think, well, hey, I could do that too, or here's another way I could kind of make this cooler. Um, so it's kind of an evolutionary process. Um, as far as the future of these videos, I am uh, planning or hoping to make some more. Um, you know, these are unsponsored videos, so I, I guess how many I make will be uh, dependent on the response to them. Um, you know, really all I get out of these is kind of the feeling that I have helped some people uh, understand and make better use of their teletype. Um, so, you know, if this if you find this helpful, please uh, let me know. Like the video, subscribe, um, comment on the lines post. Um, the feedback's important. It just kind of lets me know uh, that, you know, these are doing what I set out to have them do. So, um, I think that's it for now. This is Joe signing off. Take care.